Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla, and I am back with stories of the pilgrims. And we are getting very close to the end of this book. Today's story is entitled, The Candle. In the little village of Swansea lived a widow with her two children, Mary and Benjamin. The mother was a very good woman, always ready to nurse the sick, feed the hungry, and do anything she could to help those who needed her. Indians lived in the forest around Swansea, and this good woman was always kind to them. When they were ill, she went to see them and made them broth and gave them medicine. She tried to teach them about the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of them came to her house, and she read the Bible to them. Nearly all of the Indians loved her and would do anything for her. Among the Indians who came to this house was one named Wormsley. He was very fond of cider and would ask for it at every house. When cider has stood for some time, he, we say it becomes hard. Hard cider is not fit to drink. It is only fit to make vinegar. Wormsley liked the hard cider best. One day he came to the house and asked Mary for hard cider. I cannot give it to you, she said. It makes you drunk. Here's a picture of Mary's hearth where she's cooking for the folks that need her. When Wormsley grew angry and he said, you get cider quick. Mary called her mother, who said, No, Wormsley, cider is wrong. Then the Indian pretended to be sick and said he needed it for medicine. No, you can never get cider here, said Mary's mother again. Oh, how angry Wormsley was then. His proud eyes flashed, and he said, You be sorry, me pay you. Big fight soon. Indians kill all English. Me pay you, ugh. Sure enough, the big fight came sooner than anyone thought. The very next Sunday, as they were coming home from the church, the Indians fell upon the people, killing many and burning their homes. This, you remember, was the beginning of King Philip's war. But the Indians remembered the kind woman who had been their friend, they did not harm her family or her home. But she did not forget the angry, angry words of Wormsley. I know quite well the other Indians will not harm us, but I am afraid of Wormsley, she would say. For a long time after this, she would not allow Mary or Benjamin to go away from the house alone. The summer passed, and Wormsley did not come. At last... Philip was dead, and the dreadful war was ended. Autumn came, and with it, peace and thanksgiving. I think Wormsley must have been killed in the war, said the mother at last. One day, early in November, she began to make her winter supply of candles. She hung two great kettles of tallow over the fire to melt. I think we will make a sparkler candle such as we used to have in England when I was a little girl, she told the children. Mary clapped her hands in delight. I think there can be no harm in a sparkler candle, thought Benjamin's mother, as she sent him to find a goose quill. When he came back, she showed him how to put a little powder into it. Very carefully, the quill of powder was tied to a wick, which hung over a small stick. Then Mary and Benjamin held the stick and let the wick down into the melted tallow. When they drew it up, it was covered with tallow. This soon grew hard, and they dipped it again. Now they could hardly see the quill or the wick because the thick white coat of tallow around them. The candle grew thicker each time it was dipped, and at last it was done. So what was over the kettle on the fire was the tallow, wasn't it? It was getting ready to make the candles. Now 
you must not put it where it is too cold or it will crack, said their mother. So they put it up on the kitchen shelf where they could look at it. Oh, it is more than a month until the party, said the mother. The candle will grow yellow and ugly if you leave it there. So it was carefully wrapped in paper and put away in a box. But every few days the children would get it out and look at it. They would gently rub its smooth sides and wonder just where that quill of powder was hidden. Would the day never come? Weeks before, they had invited every child in the school to a special party, but since there was only ten pupils, it did not make a very large party after all. Benjamin hunted for the rosiest apples and the sweetest nuts and put them away for the candle party. From the beams above the fireplace hung many ears of popcorn, dry and shining. At last the party day came, but no one thought of staying home from school or work because it was special. So the children all went to school, and it was well they did, for the day would have seemed endless to them. The party was in the evening, and the candle must not be lighted until dark. But dark comes very early during the winter time, and as soon as the little folks were made clean and ready after school, it was time to go to the party. In the big kitchen, a fire burned merrily in the fireplace. How the flames snapped and crackled as they leaped up the great chimney. Benjamin passed the rosy-cheeked apples, and the children put them in a row on the hearth to roast. On the bricks near the fire, they placed a pile of chestnuts and covered them with hot ashes. The powder candle was lighted and placed upon the table, and all of the other candles were snuffed out. So here's a picture of the children as they're dipping the candle. So this was the, the powder quill, they called it, and then they're dipping it in. All of the other candles were snuffed out, so it's dark except for one candle. By and by, the chestnuts on the hearth began to burst their shells and pop out. At each loud pop, the children would jump and look at the candle. When that candle goes off, you will not think it is a chestnut, laughed Benjamin. It will make a noise like a gun. Then the storytelling began. The children did not have storybooks in those days. All the stories they knew were those told to them by parents and friends. These were usually true stories of the wild life in those early times. What a fuss Tiggy is making, said Mary. What do you suppose he is barking and growling at? I hear voices outside, answered her mother. Very likely some of the parents have come for their children. I will go out and quiet Tiggy and tell them that he is tied. When she stepped to the door, she could hear voices near the old cider press. Surely those tall, dark figures were not those of her neighbors. When her eyes had grown more used to the darkness, she could see plainly the forms of three Indians who now came toward the house. She hurried into the house and locked the door. She had hardly reached the room where the children were when there was a loud crash and the Indians broke down the door and came in. Great was her terror when she saw that their leader was Wormsley. Cider now, said Wormsley, as he sat down near the table. So here's a picture of her giving apples to the Indians. What could the woman do? She must not give them cider. There was nothing more terrible than a person who is drunk. It must be getting late, she thought, and the men will soon come for their children. If I can only get Wormsley's mind off the cider until then. So here she is, just women in the house and children. She passed the Indians apples and nuts, cold meat and bread, and they ate greedily. But they did not forget the cider. White squaw gets cider quick, 
said Worms Wormsley, shaking his big tomahawk with an ugly look. Oh, if the neighbors would only come now, thought the mother as she went slowly to the cupboard. She took down a large brown pitcher and set it on the table. Then she slowly walked back to the cupboard and took down her pewter mugs one at a time. The Indians watched her with eager eyes. White squaw, get cider quick, repeated Wormsley, looking uglier than ever. But the words were hardly out of his mouth when there was a great flash of light. Puff! Bang! went the candle with a noise like the firing of a cannon. Benjamin had put too much powder in the quill. There was a loud rattling of the dishes and the windows. The children screamed in terror. Even the fire was much scattered and dimmed by the shower of ashes. Then all was strangely still. The smelly powder smoke filled the room, and everything was hidden in thick darkness. When the smoke cleared away, the reviving light of the fire showed the hatchets of the Indians on the floor and the kitchen door wide open. Not an Indian was to be seen. No doubt they thought the white men were upon them, so they made their way back to the forest as fast as possible. That was the last the colonists ever saw of Wormsley. The neighbors had heard the noise of the candle and now came to take their children home from the party. How astonished they were to hear the story of the Indians. God has been very good to us in saving thee and our children from the Indian warriors, they said. Each year after that, a special candle was burned in many homes, and the story of how one saved the children of Swansea never grew old. When the children who were at that party grew to be men and women, they told it to their children and their grandchildren, and the grandchildren have passed this story down to us. So the people who wrote this book um, got the story from the grandchildren of those pilgrims. The children and the great-grandchildren and the great-great-grandchildren passed that story down. So um, I thought that was a really interesting story. And they um, had the candle was, uh, they had a whole party for the candle. And um, it was kind of like a firecracker, wasn't it? Uh, maybe that was our first firecracker, was that that um, candle that the pilgrims made. Um, so um, they called it a, a sparkling candle, or what was it that they called it? Um, let me see what, what it was that they called that candle. If I could, a sparkler candle. So sparklers that we hold as children and, and spin around. Maybe that's the same idea as that sparkler candle. But they put a little bit too much powder in that candle. But it had a purpose, didn't it? Um, I guess the Lord let them put a lot of powder in that candle because it made a big mess, but it scared away the Indians and nobody got hurt. Um, so uh, that was the first uh, firecracker. Okay, so this is um, Grandma Carla. And I love you.